In this video, we're going to discuss a very interesting phenomenon, the hydraulic jump. And for the case of a jump in a horizontal rectangular channel, we'll use the fundamental equations of fluid flow to derive expressions relating the depths up and down stream of the jump and for calculating the energy losses in the jump. Here's a phenomenon you've probably seen hundreds of times, but have you ever thought about what's happening here? The flow of water over the base of the sink is demonstrating a distinct change of phase and a corresponding change in water level. There's a standing jump at a fixed distance from where the water from the tap hits the base of the sink, which moves in or out depending on the flow rate of the water from the tap. This is known as a hydraulic jump. Here's some footage of a hydraulic jump in a narrow flume with a constant flow rate. And we can see clearly that both the difference in depth and the location of the standing jump are maintained under steady flow conditions. Hydraulic jumps are natural energy dissipators. The rapidly flowing liquid on the left here expands and converts kinetic energy into potential energy with energy losses due to the turbulence in the jump. Such jumps form naturally in channels when, for example, the slope goes from being steep to shallow, when the channel width has a significant increase, or when a stream flows into a static body of water such as a reservoir or lake. They are also common after hydraulic structures that produce fast shallow flow, such as partially open sluice gates and they are generated intentionally for their energy dissipation properties after structures such as weirs and spillways. OK, so let's look at a hydraulic jump under steady flow conditions. In a horizontal rectangular channel, we can obtain relations between the variables of the hydraulic jump using the fundamental equations of fluid flow, conservation of matter, energy and momentum. Before we proceed, we need a control volume for our analysis. We take two cross sections, one upstream and one downstream of the jump, sufficiently far away from the jump for the depths and average velocity to have settled to constant values, with cross section one upstream and cross section two downstream of the jump. And I label the cross sectional areas, velocity and depths as a1u1 and h1 upstream, and a2u2 and h2 downstream. h1 is called the initial depth or first sequent depth, and h2 is called the subsequent depth or second sequent depth. We refer to the pair as conjugate depths. We'll use the continuity and momentum equation to find the relationship between the conjugate depths. Now, we've already noted that there's a loss of energy across the jump, and we can use the Bernoulli equation to evaluate the magnitude of the energy loss. What we have is an energy diagram that looks like this. Assuming no change in elevation across the jump, and remembering that for open channel flow the pressure head term in the Bernoulli equation is simply the water depth, we have the equation h1 plus u1 squared over 2g equals h2 plus u2 squared over 2g plus delta e, where delta e is the energy loss in the jump. We'll come back to this. First, I'm going to introduce the notion of the Froude number. The Froude number is a non-dimensional number which is a measure of the ratio of inertial and gravitational forces. Is calculated by dividing the average velocity by the square root of g times the pressure head. In flow with a free surface, inertial and gravitational forces are predominant, so the Froude number is of great significance. There are three cases of interest. Flow with a Froude number greater than 1 is called supercritical flow. Flow with a Froude number less than 1 is called subcritical flow and flow with a Froude number equal to 1 is called critical flow. In the hydraulic jump, 
supercritical flow changes into subcritical flow. OK, so let's proceed with our analysis. First, we apply the continuity equation, giving us Q equals U1A1, which equals U2A2. Now, in this case, we have a rectangular channel, and thus the cross-sectional area is just the water depth times the channel width, for which we usually use the letter B. We thus have U1H1 equals U2H2. Next, we apply the momentum equation, giving rho QU1 plus F1 minus F2 equals rho QU2 where F1 and F2 are the pressure forces acting on the control volume. Note the direction of these forces. They are acting inwards on the control volume. There are equal and opposite pressure forces at the cross sections, but they are not relevant to the momentum equation. If we assume a hydrostatic pressure distribution at cross sections 1 and 2, then F1 and F2 can be evaluated using the pressure prisms shown here. If this doesn't look familiar, you might like to look at my previous video on hydraulic thrust calculation using pressure diagrams. Substituting for Q, F1 and F2 in the momentum equation gives us this equation. And dividing throughout by rho and B gives U1 squared H1 plus a half GH1 squared minus a half GH2 squared equals U2 squared H2. Now, we also know that U1H1 equals U2H2, giving us U2 equals U1H1 over H2. This allows us to eliminate U2 from our equation, giving us this equation. Now it's just a matter of rearranging these and tidying up, resulting in this cubic in H2 over H1. Reminding ourselves of the definition of the Froude number, we can see that U1 squared over GH1 can be written as the square of the Froude number at cross section 1. We thus have this equation. Now, just to make it a bit easier to see what's happening, let's set x equal to H2 over H1 and let A equal the constant 2FR1 squared. We thus have this cubic to solve. Now we can see by inspection that x equals 1 is one solution to this, so we know that x minus 1 is a factor of the cubic expression. This enables us to factorise the equation, giving x minus 1 times x squared plus x minus a equals 0. We thus have three solutions, x equals 1, and x equals minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 squared plus 4a divided by 2. We note here that h1 doesn't equal h2, as that would only be the case if there was no jump. Thus, we know that x equals 1 isn't a solution of interest to us. We also know that x and a are both positive, since the h1 and h2 are positive and fr1 squared is positive. This means there's only one solution that makes sense in this context. x equals a half of the square root of 1 plus 4a minus 1. Substituting for x and a gives us this result. Multiplying both sides of this expression by h1 gives us h2 equals h1 over 2 times the square root of 1 plus 8 fr1 squared minus 1. With some manipulation, we can also generate the result h1 equals h2 over 2 times the square root of 1 plus 8 fr2 squared minus 1. We thus have expressions for calculating conjugate depths in a hydraulic jump, in which one depth can be calculated entirely based on the depth and velocity at its conjugate. Going back now to the Bernoulli equation, we also have an expression for the head losses across the jump, the sum of the piezometric head loss and the velocity head loss. Factorising the velocity head terms gives us the expression 
delta E equals H1 minus H2 plus 1 over 2G times U1 minus U2 times U1 plus U2. Well, we can unravel this further by going back to the equations we derived earlier from the continuity and momentum equations. Looking first at this one, which came from the momentum equation, combined with the continuity equation, we have u1 h1 u1 plus a half gh1 squared minus a half gh2 squared equals u1 h1 u2, which we can rearrange to give this expression for u1 minus u2. Turning next to this expression, which comes from the continuity equation, we have u1 plus u2 equals u1 times 1 plus h1 over h2, which can be written as u1 h1 times h2 plus h1 over h1 h2. OK, so now we can substitute our expressions for u1 minus u2 and u1 plus u2 into the expression for delta E, giving this expression. The g's here cancel out and so do the u1 h1 terms, leaving us with this expression. Noting further that h2 minus h1 is a common factor, we can factorise this, ultimately yielding delta E equals h2 minus h1 cubed divided by 4 h1 h2. Now, this is a really interesting result because we can see that the losses in a hydraulic jump depend only on the conjugate depths h1 and h2. They are independent of the velocities. In summary, then, we have these formulae which can be used to evaluate the behaviour of a hydraulic jump in a horizontal rectangular channel. These can be used in combination with the fundamental equations to solve real problems, such as calculating the force on a partially open sluice gate. But that is a problem for another time. Until then,